book of Titus. I will tell you, uh, so next week uh, we'll have a guest speaker, uh, Carrie Clark, here, so we won't be studying from 1 Timothy next week. So when we come back in two weeks, we have eight weeks, and uh, trying to get through First and Second Timothy and Titus, I don't know if that's going to be the case. I'd mentioned during the first week that at least the order I was thinking about doing would be First Timothy, Titus, and then Second Timothy. But uh, if it comes down to that where, you know, we're just being pushed on time, I think we're just going to look at First and Second uh, Timothy. But we'll just kind of play that week by week to see um, how that goes. So this morning we're going to be in chapter 2 of 1 Timothy. And I mentioned to you two weeks ago, I think the last comment was some very interesting topics in this, uh, in this chapter. And it very much does also speak to some c- cultural aspects. There was issues back in the day. There's just as many issues today, so, so I hope it'll be a very interesting uh, study and certainly encourage uh, your comments. Before we begin, though, let's go ahead and go to our Father in prayer. Holy God, our Creator and our Father in heaven, we come to you thankful for this day and this time that we have that we may come together to study from your holy word. We're thankful, Father, that you've revealed your word to us, and we pray to you, Father, that we may study, that we may take these lessons to heart, that we may be faithful and obedient to you, committed to doing your will. Father, we're thankful that you are our creator and our father. We're thankful for your son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus, who died for us. We're thankful for the Holy Spirit, the Holy Word, and the truth, justice. We're thankful, Father, for your son and his death on the cross, that we may be saved. We pray to you continue to be with us, that we may commit to being faithful to you, and that we may be strengthened and guided throughout this life. Also, Father, we're mindful of those associated with this congregation who are sick, our shut-ins, those who've recently lost loved ones, we pray to you, comfort, protect, and encourage them as only you can. We pray to you be with this nation, be with our leaders, that may be committed to doing your will also. We pray to you, forgive us of our sins, for it is in your Son's holy name we offer this prayer. Amen. So the first chapter of uh, 1 Timothy, you know, we have there that Paul is writing to Timothy, and he states at the very beginning as an apostle. And he says, Timothy, there's some issues that are going on in Ephesus, and it's time for you to step up. Those things need to be changed. You need to be out there working for sound doctrine. And so we have the groundwork. That initial charge is made. Paul briefly goes back and speaks about his conversion in Acts chapter 9. I think it's a combination of really establishing his credibility as we enter into chapter 2 here and all of the instructions that he's going to be given to Timothy having to do with Ephesus. But also, I think it's one of an encouragement to Timothy, and we'll find here intermingled with these verses that Timothy's young and he needs encouragement, and I think maybe there's times that maybe he's having some struggles. He's very much of a human being, but to think of this young man and what he's being charged to do. So, so we see that in chapter 1, and then we end those last three verses that Paul mentions, these two individuals that... Um, were removed from the congregation there in Ephesus, and it sounds like that was probably through church discipline. So now that he's done that, now we're going to get into chapter 2, and he's going to start getting far more specific of the instructions that he's going to be given to Timothy, and we're also going to see here that based on these instructions that these are issues that are going on there in in the church in Ephesus. And so, um, but some very interesting subject matter. I'd mentioned that throughout these three epistles that the two themes you're going to see here is one of sound doctrine and also the one of change. And so this morning, as we enter into chapter 2, we see here worship in a time of change. There's some issues going on with worship and that they need to be corrected here in Ephesus. And this is what we're going to see here in uh, chapter 2. So let me just pick up here and just uh, do a little bit of an introduction here before we get started. So of the many changes the church now faces just like back uh, 2,000 years ago, none is more likely to cause controversy than the order of public worship. And we'll have more on that here in a minute And speaking of more contemporary times and the issues that are being faced with the church today. But in the New Testament, we see divisions over the conditions of membership for Gentiles back 2,000 years ago, as well as the nature of Christ. That was one of the earlier debates in the church. Um, In the following centuries, uh, these debates continued over the nature of Christ as well as the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There was issues over that. Exactly how did all that work? So um, the first council of Nicaea in 325 A.D. met together, and this was an ecumenical meeting. This was 
all the different faiths and beliefs within the larger realm of what you would call the church they met. And they issued, or uh, they had issues related to the relationship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And it was there that they finally made this determination that it's, that it's three aspects of one. It's the Godhead, but the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So that was a debate that they were having very early on in the church there in the first uh, two, three hundred years of, um, of the church. So you had issues with that that took place. Um, you moved down several centuries during the Protestant Reformation. And that's roughly about 1517 A.D. to 1648 A.D. But you have there debates that involved issues of faith and works. At times, the heated controversy also included issues having to do with the public assembly. So this is not nothing new. It was happening during the first century. It happens throughout all these centuries. And today, as we'll discuss here in a few minutes, it's happening today. So the subject of public worship touches us deeply really for a variety of reasons. It engages our attention because it's the very fact that it's public. This involves what one sees and hears. You know, most of faith seems like it's internal, isn't it? It's what we believe in all that, but this is a public aspect of that belief. So that's why it's right there front and center, and why oftentimes we do see that that at times that there are some controversial issues and debates that take place over this. So what we sing, how we sing, who speaks and who prays. Uh, As you can imagine, there are strong opinions on these subjects and there's seldom really kind of a middle ground and in in some aspects there can't be a middle ground. God commands us to do something, we're expected to do it. But also in a word where everything appears to be changing at a disturbing pace, And I think you increasingly see that today in our culture. There's just all kinds of changes going on that we just could not have imagined here just a few years ago. You know, uh, one day you proclaim yourself to be a woman, the next day you proclaim yourself to be a man. I mean, who would have ever thought that, you know, particularly back 2,000 years ago? But it's something that we face today, all this fast-paced change that's going on in our culture Well, many of us would like to see a place that remains the same, familiar and is consistent, and that's what we should have with the church. This is a place that we should come and we should know that we can rely upon the stability of the church. Unfortunately, um, we just don't always see that here today, sadly, even within the church. Today, churches have worship committees wanting to enhance or make changes to worship. One aspect is a form of entertainment, I would say, but also one is a matter of attracting others, and sometimes truth is sacrificed for that growth. But sadly, we see a lot of this is going on today, and uh, as we get down later into the chapter, and I hope we have enough time to do this. If not, I do want to spend a little bit of time, but I do have an article that I recently saw uh, from the Abilene newspaper, and it has to do with some changes that are going out there in some of the churches in Abilene that, uh, that's uh, quite disturbing, but very much applicable to this chapter that we're going to look at. So immediately as we go into chapter 2, Paul gives instructions for the occasions when the community comes together, when the church meets. Since Timothy's task is to guard the deposit, and we had mentioned that in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 20, the public assembly was sure to become a battleground too, and that's what we're going to see here. Particularly two aspects of that, and that's going to have to do with prayer and then also on teaching. So we will see the subjects of prayer in verses 1 and 8. We're going to see the issues of teaching in verses 11 and 12. We're also going to see about community welfare and the concern not just with members of the church, but members of the larger community. We'll see that in verses 2 and verse 12. The concern is just not within the church. Also, we're going to see the subject of lifting up of holy hands in prayer in every place. So that's an interesting subject of terms of raising arms during uh, prayer, during worship service. Uh, we see that in a lot of the de- denominations. Uh, is that something that's very much applicable today? Is that something he's speaking about literally? Is it figuratively? So we're going to look at that. And, um, of course, the subject also, as I said, of teaching, specifically having to do with women. And, so, and that's a subject we'll look at uh, that's going on out in Abilene. So, so just a, a little bit of uh, what we're going to try to get through today. So we need to use the earliest church as our model for worship. 
Uh, unfortunately, we possess no precise order of worship in the New Testament. There's no specific, here's the chapter, this is what they did, then they did this, then they did that. But as we see verses throughout the New Testament, we can come together, all right, these are the attributes of worship. When we think of public assembly or worship, we think of a building with pews. However, the early assemblies oftentimes met in home settings. They were in people's homes where they met. And the maximum attendance was really determined by the size of the house. Congregations could not get too large without drawing suspicion. You imagine the, the, the city officials, or maybe, maybe be the leaders, or maybe the local congregation, or the, the synagogue, and they look at this one house, and look at all these people that are in there, and how that may draw suspicious, or suspicion uh, to these individuals. Of course, the concerns there is, what are these people doing? Are they going to undermine our society? Are they going to overthrow the government? So you can see there is a, a balance act there in terms of how these early Christians, where they met, and to what extent was that drawing attention from the public? So, or was it going to lead also to the splitting of uh, families and friends? So there's all kinds of interesting aspects here to worship here in the, the first century. And so Paul's primary concern here in 1 Timothy and at the church in Ephesus, and that's who we're specifically speaking about is the church at Ephesus, is on prayer and preaching and teaching. So with that, let's go ahead and start... Um, looking at the chapter, and as I said, uh, you know, please feel free to uh, speak up. What I plan on doing, I'm going to go down through about verse, about verse 7 or verse 8, and at that point I'll stop, and you know, as I said, if you want to make any comments, please, I certainly invite you to do so. so but as we go through this, just uh, keep in mind that the same issues that are going on back then, they're much, very much happening here in the 21st century, and sadly, just not with the denominational world, but specifically with the church. So, so here in verses 1 and 2, we have here about the church and prayer. Um, this corporate prayer was really a paramount importance to the church that was confused about public worship. And that's the issue that's going on in Ephesus. They're really confused about that. So Paul is reminding the community that worship is for God. It's directed to God, and it's for God. And because of that, God's the one that has that right to dictate how that worship is to be done toward him. And sadly, as I said, you know, times human beings, they want to do their own things. But this is why Timothy's here in Ephesus and here in chapter 2 is to remind them this is the proper way that we need to be worshiping God. So he starts out here in verse 1 of 1 Timothy chapter 2. And he says, therefore, I exert, excuse, excuse me, <clears throat> I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. So the first words of public assembly here are devoted to prayer. Uh, in bringing order to the Ephesian church, Timothy has the task of seeing that these prayers be made for everyone. You know, this term supplication there, that means an urgent request. It's one of a sense of need. Um, the term prayers literally means petition. It carries a feeling really of awe when you are approaching God, making that prayer. Um, intercessions, that term there is really a formal request to a high official. So you can't get any more higher than praying to God. And then, of course, thanksgiving is one of, a, uh, of appreciation. But you see all that's encompassing here within uh, prayer. There's a sense of need, there's a feeling of awe, and that we're making this formal request really to this very high official. And we need to be doing it in such a manner that it should be one of thanksgiving and appreciation. Now, he doesn't go into any kind of details in terms of the prayers that were going on there, but right there, just as I said in chapter 1, Paul has a way to really refine um, a large topic into just a very short snippet here in just one verse but what he's done there. But a nice summary there in terms of, of what prayer should look like. So uh, as we approach God in prayer, it should reflect our need, our awe, our concern, and our appreciation. And again, it is important for public worship. We are addressing God. We're addressing the creator of the universe. So prayer is so very important because it invites God into the situation we're praying about. We're saying, God, we need your help. Please intervene for us. 
and it secures or one of really obtaining his working on behalf of those that are in need. Paul did not deal here with the reason God had incorporated prayer into his own sovereign control within the universe, but he assures his readers, and they understood this, that since God has revealed it uh, elsewhere in Scripture. So I don't think it was something new, particularly for these people that were converts, that they knew that this was this is one aspect of the benefits of being a Christian that you know, I have access to God. I have access to the Creator. So I don't think it was something new, but it needed to be clarified in terms of exactly how you are to use this prayer and really what it's for. So his point here was that Christians must not fail to take advantage of this supernatural resource at their disposal. Don't neglect prayer. So also the church was not encouraged to forget the outside world. Notice what he says there at the end of verse 1, for all men. And that's why I said there that uh, it's just not isolated for the church, but we need to be concerned as a church for the larger community around there in the first century and, of course, for us today. Prayers were for the sake of all men, and uh, men being really all individuals. Uh, they would be concerned for the general welfare of their communities, and it shall also put to rest rumors of undermining the public order. You know, all these people that are grouped together in this house and, and public officials may be looking at that, what's going on. They come closer and they listen. And what we're doing, we're praying to our God on behalf of you, of the leader of the city or, or whatever. But that would also be one aspect of prayer, that, that we're concerned about these individuals that may otherwise look at us with suspicion. But he says, therefore, all men. And he's going to repeat that phrase here in a few minutes. So he continues and he clarifies that for all men here in verse 2, and he says, For kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. So the king at the time that Paul writes this, somewhere in the early 60s A.D., maybe about 64 A.D., when he wrote this epistle, Nero was the, the Roman Caesar. And Nero was a very brutal man, an unbeliever for whom Paul specifically told his readers to pray for. Uh, some sources believe that uh, Nero was such a, a fanatic that he set Rome on fire, roughly about 64 AD. The fire lasted for weeks. It destroyed or damaged 10 of the 14 uh, districts there in Rome. Some people think that maybe it was an accident, but others think that he was so maniacal that he's, he set the place on fire. I don't know exactly the reasoning. There's all kinds of reasons why, but it shows you the kind of person that they were dealing with uh, with the Roman Caesar. And yet Paul is saying here, no, all men, including kings, should be prayed for. Furthermore, the focus of their request was not only their own tranquility, but the king's salvation all men here again in verse 4 we're going to see. If we have a tranquil society, if we have a stable government, chances are pretty good that the church is necessarily is going to have that same kind of tranquility. There's not going to be those kind of issues with that. I mean, case in point here in the United States. I mean, for all these years, you know, we had a stable government. And it's enshrined within our Constitution, the freedom of worship. It's not that way in every country. But Paul says that's one of the reasons you pray for your leaders. You need that stability and that tranquility in this country so the church can then function without that fear of persecution from outsiders. So our goal of public worship is to live a peaceful and quiet life in all godliness and holiness. God is the primary audience. Uh, it would provide an example to others of God's reconciling work. So people see us praying to God, asking for forgiveness, you know, that's something else that they may take an interest in. Really, tell me more about this. Um, and also it would reinforce the idea that the church was not divisive or undermining public order. It would be contrary to the church's mission. We're not here to undermine earthly governments. So the assembly existed for God, yet it could not forget the relationship to outsiders at the assembly. Worship, as related to prayers should contribute to the health 
of the congregation. So members may live peaceful lives in the midst of a society that could be hostile at times. So our purpose is to bring the message of reconciliation to all people and to glorify God in all our relationships. So obviously the type of government under which people lived influences their lives and affects spiritual welfare. You know, we have the example of Ezra, chapter 6, verse 9 and 10, the decree of Darius, and he mentions there to the Jews, let it be given to them whatever to make their sacrifices. So we have an example there in the Old Testament of a leader who uh, did not have this attitude of persecution, but showed mercy upon on God's people. And then Jeremiah 29, 7, seek the peace of the city. So we have a few examples here in the Old Testament just to, to reinforce that point of, of this idea of tranquility among governments and of society and how also that can benefit the church. So this term uh, used here, um, life in all godliness and reverence, that term godliness uh, refers to the attitude of reverence of God based on the knowledge of him. So Paul used this word ten times in these, um, in these three epistles, First and Second Timothy and Titus. So it's a, it's a very common word that's used, and this here is going to be its first occurrence. But the, he emphasizes the point here throughout godliness, and of course that makes sense since one of the themes of uh, these three books is one of sound doctrine. So he introduces here in these first two uh, verses the, the point of prayer, uh, this collective prayer and time of worship. So now here he's going to continue along these same themes here for the next few uh, verses, but he starts to speak here about the story of the congregation here in verses 3 through 8. So he continues here in verse 3 and says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. And verse 4, Who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So here in verses 3 and 4, prayers of this type pleases God because it essentially is referring to our God, our Savior, the one who delights to rescue sinners from their wages of their sins. God wants us to be saved. And the benefit here of this prayer depend upon me. I will show you that mercy. I will show you that love that you need. So God wants everyone to experience eternal salvation. People perish because they do not hear the gospel, or hearing it, they choose to reject it. But God has given people freedom to choose to accept or reject the gospel, and when people reject that gospel, this causes God considerable pain. This is clear in the many references in Scripture to God's sorrowing over the fate of those who choose to spurn Him. We have an example there in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. You know, the wide gate leads to destruction, and the narrow gate leads to life, that being of eternal life. But here he gives uh, some uh, clarification here on the importance of, of prayer here, for it is good and acceptable in the sight of God, and that who desires all men to be saved. So he gives some context of the importance of prayer. And again, that goes back to why we need to be concerned not only for the brothers and sisters within the church, but also we need to be concerned about all men. So verse 5 and 6, he mentions here, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. So that term mediator is literally a go-between two parties to remove a disagreement or to reach a common goal. We needed a mediator. So that term ransom sets forth the idea that Jesus Christ died as a substitute for all of us. We have examples in Matthew 10, 45, the Son of Man came to serve. Uh, Galatians chapter 1, verse 4, he gave himself for our sins. Um, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, gave himself for me, and it just goes on and on. But we have that mediator through Christ, and he paid the price for our sins. So again, he's just kind of clarifying this importance about what we talked about prayer there at the beginning and our concerns for all of humanity. And that goes down basically to the idea of the saving the souls of individuals. So he mentions here also in the due time, um, some translations mention fullness of time, others say proper time. 
But here, um, in essence, what he's saying here, Jesus was born and died at really the right time, uh, giving his life as payment as a ransom. There was a great need for that, and there was a time that God had designated that this was going to take place. So to free human race from slavery to sin, Jesus' death made all people savable. So verse, let's see here. So let's look at verse 7. Uh, verse 8 is where I want to start spending a little more time here. I'm going a little quickly on, um, on these first few verses. But uh, here in verse 7 he says, For which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I'm speaking the truth in Christ and not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. So Paul mentions here for the second time. He mentions it's the beginning of the book. He mentions it here in chapter 2 as an apostle. So Timothy, everything I'm saying to you, I'm saying this as an apostle. So Paul's final support for his command to pray for all people is here. God had commissioned him to proclaim the gospel to the Gentile world, uh, appointed as a preacher and as an apostle, as a teacher to the Gentiles, and not just to the Jews, who were God's favorite people in the times past. But Paul proclaimed the faith faithfully and truthfully in contrast to these false teachers that are mentioned here in chapter 1. His affirmation of truthfulness further emphasizes his point that was made when he wrote to the Romans in chapter 9, verse 1, I tell you the truth, I'm not lying, my conscience also bears me witness in the Holy Spirit. So the disciples um, at Ephesus were not merely about style and taste, uh, these disputes that were going on. Uh, in fact, Paul returns to the core Christian conviction to answer their questions about the assembly. And the people appear to be confused by the content of the worship assembly. And I'm here just kind of going back and summarizing here the, these few verses that we've just looked at. But Paul states here the most basic facts about Christianity. Uh, a particular significant fact is in this use of that term all. So in verse 1, he mentions prayers for all. In verse 3, he says he wants all men to be saved. And then in verse 6, he says Christ gave himself as a ransom for all men. So that's why I mentioned earlier about this concern for the larger community. So in the public assembly, the church recalls God's mission in the word, the salvation of all people is desired. The foundation of the Christian doctrine is constantly remembered in our worship that Christ died for all and wanted all to be saved. It's part of the reason in terms of worship why we're singing praises to God. That's why we have the Lord's Supper. It goes back to the mercy and love that God showed to us that His Son died. So the public worship is neither a matter of the opinion of the worshiper nor demands uh, from the outsider uh, that worship that resembled their own past. And I think you get that you got that in the first century, you get that today. Sometimes the influences are from within the church, and sometimes these influences are from outside the church that ultimately get incorporated uh, maybe by way of our culture. But uh, Paul challenged us, us all to place Christian worship in the context of God's plan for the world and its salvation. So those are the first seven verses. And again, he, he initially mentions about prayer, but then he expands upon that and the importance of that, but certainly something that was an issue there in the first century with Ephesus and something that uh, Timothy was going to have to get in there and was going to have to correct in terms of prayer and the worship. So, so that takes us there through verse 7. Uh, at this point, is there any comments? Anyone have anything to say? Okay. Yeah, Elsie. I'll tell you, I'll tell you, hold on, we'll, we'll get Jim down there to get you the mic. <laughs> I know you have a deep you have a deep voice, but <laughs> it's also speculated that Nero burned down the city, and he also blamed it on the Christians. And the reason he burned down the city was he wanted a new city. You know, it's still speculation, but it's, it's a strong. View. It sounds like his personality. Yeah, yeah. Nero's Nero was not a good guy. He was one of those early ones that was just really serious. But yeah, I, I ran into all kinds of 
opinions on that, but um, I think that the preponderance of it tended to lean toward, yeah, he did burn it down, but what was the reason why? So, yes, Ralph. You know, there's one thing that uh, I, I can see here. And it begins in actually in verse 1. He said, therefore, I exhort, first of all, that all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and the giving of thanks be made for all men. What, what I'm seeing here is, uh, is the idea of being engaged, being a part of doing something. In this case, it's just prayers. But it, I think if you look into all of this, you're seeing everything that God has done for all of us. He has been engaged in actively helping man to be saved, to come and be with him. And I think what's happening here, he's showing how they are to be engaged in return. You know, it's like when you're singing songs. If, if you're sitting there, you know, you're, you're, not, you're not being engaged. You know, singing, you sing out, make a joyful noise, remember? And, that's the, and you have to be engaged when you give. You have to be engaged when you sit in class. You have to be engaged when you listen to the teaching. You have to be a part of what's going on. And I think all this is, is telling these people, you have to be a part. You can't just sit there. You have to be engaged. Yeah, I think the church staff says, I think it's quite chaotic. Um, you know, they, you mentioned in chapter 1 about the, the fables and, and genealogies and all that. And as we get into chapter 2, so there's issues of the prayer. And now as we get into here, we're going to talk about women here momentarily. Um, but yeah, I, I very much agree with that. I, I think you have to be engaged. I think this idea of, of what you started to see, particularly as you get in the second and third century, you started to see this idea of setting yourself apart physically from the rest of the world. And how you see how that would expand out over time with monks in the Catholic Church. Uh, that's completely contrary to what um, God wants us to do. Look at the end of Matthew 28. I mean, go out there and, and proclaim the gospel. So you're right. I think very much God wants us to be engaged. So, anyone else? Again, I'm sorry I have to read from my notes, but there seems like there's so much details here. I, I, I've gotten to a point I just can't remember all this stuff, so... So, but thank you very much for your patience on that. So, from this point forward, from verse 8 through verse 15, there's two aspects of, of worship that we see today, that we see back then, that um, cause some controversy. And here in verse 8 here, um, and just what, by way of just an introduction to this next section, just real briefly, um, he's going to speak about men here in verse 8, and then from verse 9 on, he's going to be speaking about women but the weight of advice here uh, will concern women. Um, there may have been a specific problem really concerning women at the time there in that church. Um, I, I will say, just as a way of clarification, and why I think this is specifically here, while I do think this command is a command for us today, but there were some specific issues that are going on over there in Ephesus, I think also that brought up this concern and maybe what motivated this congregation in terms of maybe uh, why it was really not good for women to be participating in the worship services they were doing. But uh, we have here in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 14, it says there that women who violated their normal roles give the enemy an occasion to slander. And there in that next verse there, uh, he speaks there about some of the young widows had already gone after Satan. So there were some issues, it seems like, with some of the women there at Ephesus that uh, they were giving in to uh, these false doctrines. And there were some concerns there. Um, but also in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse uh, 6, it speaks there about heretics were leading away weak women. And that verse there specifically says, make captives of gullible women. So at least there were some women here at Ephesus that at least that uh, they were as such that they were able to be influenced by whatever false doctrines were out there. And so I think this is a concern here as you're going to see as he's going to speak about women start here in verse 9. But he starts out here in verse 8 by talking about men. And I'm thinking that we'll probably only get to get through verse 8 today, but um, it will give us something to look forward to here in two weeks when we come back and spend some time on, um, on discussing women in worship, but also want to discuss with you briefly about some of the things that are going on in some of the churches now 
concerning women and uh, preaching. So, so I don't think we'll be able to get around to that, but we'll, uh, we'll see if we can maybe start talking about it. But, but here in verse 8, he speaks of specifically about um, men. And he says, I desire, therefore, that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. And so that term, lifting up holy hands. So we'll talk about that for a minute. And there's an article here that I found from Brother Wayne Jackson that I think also can give us uh, a little additional clarification on the subject of lifting holy hands. But he continues this thought here from verse 2. Um, Remember that assemblies met at homes versus informal buildings. But anyway, the importance of prayer and the worship. He mentions here in every place. Um, probably he's referring to wherever Christians assembled in congregations, excuse me, in view of the context. Wherever you're meeting, he's talking about men collectively, okay? I don't, I don't necessarily think he's, he's speaking here about specifically about one man getting up and leading a prayer. But he speaks about the importance of men pray everywhere. So the posture of lifting hands or um, standing with raised hands um, we know that that was a practice within some of the pagan communities. Um, and mind you, um, the church at Ephesus, uh, they had some additional challenges because one of the um, seven wonders of the ancient world is there at Ephesus, the Temple of Diana. So you had all kinds of pagan worship that was going on there. But, but we do have some indications there uh, from history that the, certainly within the pagan world that they did adopt this idea of these raising of hands as they were as they were acknowledging or praying to their gods. So, so that's just kind of a side note. And uh, we also know that there were some pictures that were found on the walls of some of these uh, catacombs. These are these, um, in essence, underground cemeteries that have these, these, these inserts off to the side that you could actually put a casket or you could put, uh, I think they called them a, an ossuary, where you'd have this, this box of bones. So underground in these catacombs... Uh, archaeologists had discovered some early art, and in that art showed believers praying this way with their hands up. So uh, they commonly, at least the belief was at the time, that they commonly raised their hands upward and open to heaven, evidently to symbolize their inner openness to God, uh, as well as their desire to offer praise to God and to obtain a gift from Him. So we have some examples there by archaeology that that at least you see that there was this raising of hands. But the question is, based on this verse, is that something that's actually, does Paul actually say it's all right to do that? So if Paul had meant um, that the men were simply to lift up their physical hands when they prayed, he probably would have not described hands as holy. And I think that's the key word here. He mentions holy hands. And so you look at the context of the verse with the word holy with wrath and doubting, that this really probably all points to a metaphorical use of hands. It's really a metaphor. Um, our hands symbolize what we do. Paul wanted the men to pray in the same reverent attitude with which they practiced holiness in their everyday lives. Posture in prayer does not render the prayer more or less effective. By raising those hands, it does not do anything to make that prayer any more effective in terms of praying to God. But it often reflects really more along the lines of this inner attitude of the person praying. So I think that uh, the gesture, at least what he kind of talks about here, this holy hands, is more of a gesture really of submission to God. So the question is, is that something that is scriptural? Is it allowable? I don't think it's something that you're going to lose your soul over. But I do want to read you an article here by uh, Wayne Jackson. Uh, he's got a website called The Christian Courier, and a longtime faithful gospel preacher. And uh, I have some reference books on him, and, and he really does good about explaining this aspect of this idea of, of raising your arms or raising your hands during worship service and explaining not only the context of this passage, but we do have examples in the Old Testament that speaks about that same thing. So if you'd permit me, let me go ahead and just read this article, and it kind of gives you some kind of clarification in terms of maybe today and this idea of um, raising hands. So the question, at least I think someone had submitted to his website, it says, in his letter to Timothy, Paul said that men are to pray lifting up holy hands to God. 
from 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. Why don't people lift up their hands when they pray today? So he starts to answer the question, and he um, is going to lay out some examples of how the Israelis prayed, and then he'll move over to the New Testament. But he says here, the lifting up of holy hands is most likely an expression borrowed from the Old Testament because of a common ancient practice. Though neither mandated or enforced as law, it was very common in ancient times for one to raise his hands when praying. So it wasn't something that was so much commanded or it was within Scripture, but it was something that at least it's believed that they did at the time. Well, he goes on, he gives some examples of back in the Old Testament. We have here this mention of uh, raising uh, or lifting hands. And so when Solomon prayed at the dedication of the temple, he spread forth his hands toward God in 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 22. In one of his prayers, David exclaimed, Hear the voice of my supplication when I cry upon you, when I lift up my hands toward your holy oracle. That's found in Psalms 28, verse 2. So he continues here, To the superficial, the hypocritical worshipers in the era of Isaiah, the prophet, the Lord, God, said, and this is from Isaiah 1, 15, And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Yes, when you make... Many prayers I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. So these passages illustrate uh, the fact that on occasions the Hebrews held up their hands when they prayed. Um, But it wasn't always the case that the Israelis raised their hands in prayer. Other postures and manners of praying are also mentioned. Um, Prayer was made standing. We have an example there in 1 Samuel 126. They kneeled, 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 54. They were lying down, uh, 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 42. They were audible. It was something that was spoken out. John 17, verse 1, and John 18, verse 1. Prayer was also silently done. We have an example there in 1 Samuel 1, 13. Um, also the bowing of the head we find in Genesis 24, 26. And also with uplifting eyes, again, in John 17, 1. So it would be a mistake to think that any particular posture or manner of praying is preferred over others. Obviously, the manner of prayer was not a binding pattern. We see all kinds of aspects of prayer, and there's not anything that would be specifically, you need to do this, you need to do that. So um, what about holy hands that's mentioned here in 1 Timothy? So furthermore, literally speaking, there is no such thing as really holy hands. It's really a figure of speech. Uh, Holy hands stand for the holy person. In uh, Proverbs uh, chapter 6, verse 16 through 19, there are several body components that are used metaphorically to stress certain evil actions. Um, It's uh, mentioned is made of haughty eyes, a lying tongue, a murderous hands, a wicked heart, and a mischievous feet. But again, they're all metaphors. It's not something that is literal. So the point being made in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8 is this, that those who lead the worship or public worship, as it would be, must be holy men. That's what he's speaking about there. In view of this, how serious are, uh, a responsibility is it for men who are leading the church worship to be of a very highest spiritual quality to employ worldly men for a lesser motive? is a woefully misguided effort. You need holy men that are the ones that are doing these prayers. And that's really more the emphasis of what um, is believed to be spoken here, okay? So, he concludes the article by saying, so is it wrong to lift up hands during worship? And so some have inquired as to whether there is anything wrong with people raising their hands when they pray, even in the public assembly. So in some churches, this is becoming more common. There's nothing really intrinsically wrong with the practice. Uh, Perhaps, however, a word of caution would be, uh, would uh, not be out of place, and adamantly one must be cautious here. And so he gives here three points as he concludes this article. But these are things that we need to keep in mind as you consider this idea of maybe, you know, do you, the way as you pray, do you want to actually raise your hands as you're doing that prayer? So Wayne says here, first, this practice in uh, the modern community of Christendom 
is generally identified with the hyper-emotional Pentecostal church, Pentecostalism, um, who are known to thrust aside scriptural restraint for the so-called charismatic experience. It's based on emotion. It's not anything that's based actually on the Word of God. So one may wish to consider whether uh, he wants to leave the impression that he is inclined in this direction. So certainly that may be something you may want to consider. Also, second, the phenomena is finding some level of a comfort zone among the more liberal congregation of the Lord's people. Uh, the hands-up posture may send a signal to some that more contemporary worship is being tested, something more emotional and less formal. So it may also be a matter of just what impression are you leaving maybe to other people that are visiting here? And what concerns that may bring up with them in terms of are you trying to introduce more change within the, the, the uh, worship service than other than, than what we have that's scriptural? So that's something else we may cons- want to consider. And also third, one might consider whether such a novel practice might create a distraction for others. So he concludes with that. So is it something that that, that it's just very black and white? No. But certainly he gives some considerations. That's why I wanted to read the article because he, he actually goes into a lot more detail and kind of explains maybe you know some things you need to consider. But I, I know that that's something that I think at least the indication I get more and more you're starting to see this, but it's a matter, you know, it's not a, an issue of salvation, but is it maybe the, the best thing that we need to be doing or maybe we need to use more caution? So... So uh, we don't have time to get into verse 9 through the end of the chapter, but, but I will tell you it does speak about, um, about women uh, in the worship, and uh, I'll just leave it with this. So um, I don't think in any way does this say anything about the women being less capable of leading prayer or in teaching, and we'll get more into that, and there's examples of women and what they're doing, and it's not a matter that they're less important. There is a certain order that's in place, and we have to respect that because that's something that's come down from God. Uh, I will say also that, that here in two weeks when we come back, I will go ahead and uh, speak to you about an article that was in, in the newspaper in Abilene uh, this past Monday. And uh, it talks about a few of the congregations out there, a few of the churches of Christ, that are now starting to allow women to preach. Uh, there, there was even questions, and I think it's even come up with one committee or one worship uh, service where they had a committee that got together and started discussing about women as elders and deacons. So, so there's some disturbing things that are going on out there, but I will tell you this woman that, that the article will go on to talk about, and, we'll, and I'm not going to read the whole article because it's quite lengthy, and if you want a copy, I'll be more than happy to send it to you, but, but she's a, a graduate student at Abilene Christian in the School of Theology, and... Uh, Back this spring, they, um, they allowed her to get up and preach. So, so uh, I th- as I said, I think it's an important subject because it also speaks about what's going on here in the 21st century. But, um, but we'll leave that for another time. We just don't have enough time to discuss that topic, and certainly I think that deserves, um, it deserves far more time for that. So, but uh, with that, uh, is there any comments you all have about at least of the uh, lifting up of hands from verse 8 or anything else we've discussed? Okay, I think we have about a minute and a half, so I'll go ahead and let y'all go early. But thank you very much for your attention. Certainly appreciate it. And again, uh, we won't be speaking about First Timothy again here for two weeks. I think, um, who is it? Carrie Clark from Athens will be here next week as our guest speaker. So, All right, thank you for your attention. <laughs>